Well, good morning. Good morning, Bible Center. Uh, hopefully you feel welcome, whether you're here in person or whether you're online. And I was just thinking, I mean, praise and worship was just wonderful. And just like practicing for eternity, right? Do you ever think about that? Like you are practicing for eternity. So will you be singing? Will you be dancing? What will you be doing for eternity? So amen. Right. That's right. All right, so I do need to do a little um, spiritual growth check. So there has been some good stuff going on this week. So women's Bible study um, is 9 o'clock on the first, sun, uh, first Saturday of every month. It's online. We're going through the Kingdom Woman. And here's the beautiful thing. It is at 9 o'clock. We're on Zoom. You don't even have to turn your camera on, right? So if you just so if you're a, a woman at Bible Center, I want you to say that in your calendar. 9 o'clock, it's one hour. It is so wonderful. We were talking about um, just being diamonds in the rough yesterday and the fact that God redeems us like, you know, a diamond miner and our testimony, the power of testimony. So just put that in your phone, right? And legit, you don't have to turn your camera on. So whatever you're doing at, or however you're looking at nine o'clock on Saturday, the first Saturday of the month, please join us on Zoom because it's so good. And then in Bible study this morning, we were in Psalm 51 and talking about that was the psalm after um, David had confessed his, his sin. Nathan brought it to his attention and how he had a broken and contrite you know, spirit. And we talked about that, right? How we need to um, just call sin, sin, you know, call it out in our own lives and ask God to purify us so that we'll be right with him. And so all of this great stuff is happening. And so you don't need to feel like, I don't know, spiritually starved or something, right? You don't, <laughs> because there are things, and it speaks, I mean, I don't know, Bible study speaks to me every time I'm in a Bible study. So please just put those, and there are, like I said, there's Sunday morning in person, but they're also online. So you could listen in your car, you could be at home getting dinner, whatever it is, but don't um, not connect with the word of God. So amen. All right. So glad you're here. That was my little spiritual growth check message. Uh, this afternoon, what a wonderful opportunity we have to fellowship. It is our church picnic. Hopefully you're coming. Hopefully you're bringing somebody. Um, if you didn't fix something, don't worry about it. There's always so much food, right? But we're there to fellowship, get to know one another, have a great time. And so that's at one o'clock. So from one to six, come for whatever time you'd like. Um, and and it's at Westinghouse Lodge, which is in Forest Hills. And so if you need information about that, you can see me um, after service. A couple of, um, on September 11th, we're going to celebrate Grandparents Day. So invite your grandparents or, you know, we'll just be doing some special things for grandparents. And then on October 1st, we're going to have a senior resource fair. And so we're going to have a speaker come and talk about resources that are available for um, seniors in our community. And we'll also have um, vendors. And so we'll be part down here with a presenter and upstairs, but we want to make sure that every senior in our community, and it's not just Homewood um, seniors, it's anywhere, so if you know someone, please ask them to put that date on their calendar. We'll have a full breakfast. There's no cost. It's going to be great, and so put that on your calendar. One more um, announcement. I think we'll, we'll do it formally later this week. We are um, going to be, as we move into the fall, talking about ministering to our community, and so we're going to have an online training. There's a book that um, we have ordered, and then we're uh, bringing a consultant in from Minnesota. It's the, the fourth Saturday in September. And so we are, I don't know, the word was just, uh, God was speaking to me during praise and worship. We're an outpost in this community, right? And so I think about the, um, the health fair yesterday, the fact that Bible Center had a table. We are a light in this community. And so God has placed us here, I believe, to you know, turn this community around. And so we're going to spend time over the next couple of months learning to minister to our community. We need to learn to listen. We need to learn to you know, you know, understand how to respond. So if you are interested in participating in that training, um, please see me and we'll have some more information um, later. But anyone who is interested in learning to listen, uh, learning how to minister to this community, we want you to take part in that training. So, amen. Great. And uh, next Saturday, actually, at 9 a.m. at Everyday Cafe, we'll have Exploring Membership. So there are a number of folks who've been coming and folks that we've uh, reached out to, folks who may be even online if you're in the city and you're considering Bible Center as your church home. 
we'd love to have you come and just explain who we are, what we do, why we do, and then you can make an informed decision. Amen. It was amazing to have the band back together today. Amen. Everybody was back. It felt good. Uh, some hit me. It said, uh, worship worth getting up for. Amen. You know what I mean? You're going to get up in the morning and the opportunity to come together and worship the Lord together is so powerful. I know that there are folks who are preparing for the picnic who didn't quite make it to service this morning, but I guess that's all good. I guess that's kind of something. But anyway, it's all good. <laughs> make sure that chicken is right. All right. Um, <laughs> so as, as was mentioned uh, yesterday, we had the health fair, which was amazing, and um, then continuing to serve. And so one of the things that we're working on as we update both our facilities, upstairs is going on, they did some work, more work in the back there. And we want to um, update our website to communicate accurately who we are. And so as we're thinking about that and wrestling with who are we, the things that come to mind are, first of all, consistent with our mission, right? We love God. So we try to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. The second is we love people. And that means caring for people, taking care of people, both in our uh, course within our congregation, but also in the broader community. And then we live like Jesus. We demonstrate the love of Jesus to other people through our acts and through our service. And so just wanted to show you, um, there was a nice little conversation yesterday. One of the, and want to thank the folks who manned the table all day yesterday. It was beautiful despite the, <clears throat> the threat of rain, but the Lord held things up. And so I want to share just a little uh, quick video from a woman who uh, came by the table and they just had a little conversation with her about how Bible Center had impacted her life and her life of her family. The six children in my relatives household received the benefits of the breakfast and lunch meals, which was a great resource for us. It was delivered on time, three days a week. The drivers were respectful, communication was so simple and easy, and we were very appreciative. Right, so she just talked about how for two years we provided meals for the six children in her family and the six children in her friend's family uh, through. Uh, the, the meal delivery. And so we thank God for that opportunity to be a blessing and you never know who you impact. Praise God. And then the, uh, this next video is uh, Sister Cora and just sharing her testimony. Many of you know her journey and she um, had cancer. And so she uh, just recorded a little video about that experience and about her relationship with our faith community. So I'd ask that the fellas in the back would share that as well. Hi everyone. I'm just I'm 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 sorry if I could not make this perfect, but I'll try. Hi Bible Center knows me because they prayed for me each and every day and there's too many people has been so kind to me while I'm going through this. But I thank everyone for that. I just wanted to make a testimony for whatever happened to me. I, I got diagnosed with uterine cancer, endometrial cancer in November of 2021. And when all my tests has been done, uh, multiple tests has been done. My my first oncologist was telling me that my cancer is in stage four based on my CT scan result. I don't know how scared I am. I panic and I tell everyone in the church that I, yeah, please pray for me because I'm so scared that she took a fluid a sample from my lungs. She took a tissue sample from my lungs. She took a tissue sample from my lymph nodes. And she never find any cancer in it. Praise yeah, Jesus. I praise Jesus for healing me for this. So the day of the surgery has come. It was February 14. No, February 15 at 9.30 in the morning, 
Pastor John has called me before they wheeled me to the surgery and he prayed for me first and I thank him for that. Thank you so much. Sorry. The surgery was success. I never have any complication. And after I came out from the hospital, too many people have sent regards and sent me some food and help us for our meal. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. And as you know, our core continues to heal, continues to get better. And it's things like that remind us why we need a faith community, right? It's fine to, um, you know, just kind of be out there doing your thing. But when life gets very hard, you need somebody that is praying for you, that will come see you, provide a meal. Sometimes it's just coming and sitting with you and being quiet. Amen. But knowing that you're loved, knowing that you're cared for. So it is important continue to be connected to a faith community. And so I want to thank Bible Center because when I hear from people both in the congregation and people out in the community about the things that we're doing, and often, you know, I, I try to be low key about like, tell me about that church up the street, right? So people maybe don't know me, don't. But the point is, our reputation is good in the community. Amen. Our reputation is good with people. And so despite whatever, uh, you know, stuff we're going through and the appearance and the physical and all that stuff, God has blessed us tremendously, and he's placed on us the call to be his representation in the world, right? Citizens of the kingdom, called to advance his kingdom, make earth more like heaven, to bring the presence of the Lord and expand that so that people know who God is. And we get the opportunity, the Bible says, ambassadors of the kingdom. And it says when we are redeemed, 1 Colossians 3, I believe it is, he says, God has, when Christ comes, he actually redeems us or translates us or transforms us or takes us from the dominion of darkness and places us into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, we then represent that kingdom, that country. And so that's why we do what we do, to give an op a t opportunity, to earn the opportunity to tell people because being a Christ follower should be worth following. People should ask, what do you do? Why do you do that? And that is our opportunity to tell people about the country that we're from, the kingdom of God, about our king, Jesus Christ, and then to invite them into the opportunity that you too can become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so thank you. Appreciate you. God bless you. We're going to receive our offering. If you're online, if you're here in the place, doesn't matter. As you know, we have multiple ways to give. And when we give, we use those resources to invest and be a blessing in other people. And so thank you for your giving. We're going to uh, move on with the service. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you for these testimonies. But God, we thank you that everything that we have is from you and is for you. And so, Lord God, we ask that you help us as we seek to use the resources that you invest in us in ways that are productive, that maximize your glory, that make you look good, Lord God, and that touch people's hearts so they may come to know you and that they would desire to become citizens of the kingdom of God. So we love you today. We exalt you. We give you thanksgiving. We give you praise, we give you glory and honor. We pray this prayer now in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. And as, uh, our deacons will be by the doors or whatever you're in the house and want to give uh, a bit later. So as you know, we've been doing this series called Extraordinary. How, oh, that's right. You're supposed to pay for the babies. Leah, will you please come? God, I thank you. Yes, God. I thank you for our children, God. I thank you for the children in Babel Center, and I thank you for the children in our community. Yes. God, I ask that you touch every household, even now, God. Anyone who is in lack, God, I ask that you will give them more than they can even ask or think. God, allow our community to know that we are praying for our children, that it is you who is supplying every need. It is you who care about our children enough to make sure that people are put in place 
place to minister love and pour into our children each and every day, God. I thank you, God, for the people we have here in Babel Center that pray for our children daily, God. They don't just wait for a Sunday service, but they pray each and every day for our children, God. They have a heart like you have a heart. You said in your word that you care about the children, God. God, you tell us to pray and care and pour into our children and people here in Babel Center truly honor that message, God. God, I thank you for everything that you plan to do as school is coming, God. I pray that um, homes are getting prepared, God. It seemed like the summer went so fast. So I pray for the parents who are trying to prepare for their children to go back to school. God, I ask that you will provide every need God, I ask that you will allow no anxiety to fill their home, God, but allow them to be more than prepared and allow them to know again that this help did not just randomly come. It wasn't just, it just so happened to be a book bag drive, that it was something that was provided by you. So God, I thank you. And as our children even go to Children's Church today, God, I ask that you will allow that message to sink in the hearts of our children, God. God, that this next generation will not grow up to be a generation that will say they don't know you. So I thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. The young people can go to Children's Church upstairs. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> we've been doing this series called Extraordinary, how God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And although all of us are just ordinary people, if we make ourselves available, God can use us to do extraordinary, impactful, and purposeful things. And so it's human nature when we see people, when we see people at a distance, right, we focus primarily on people's demography. Is that true? I see you at a distance. I pay attention to generally your, your gender, your race, your height. Uh, maybe uh, I learned where you, where you were born where you come from, the neighborhood that you live in, right? There are all of these things. And so then, unfortunately, we often, because of our own biases, both conscious and unconscious, our stereotypes, we have beliefs about people. I'll give you an example. You see an a African-American guy, 6 foot 10, 6 11, what do you think? Basketball player. Basketball player. See, so you don't know anything about this dude. <laughs> Whatsoever, it might be a cellist. Right, but you like basketball player. I know he is. Right, that's the way our mind works. You see a man with a stethoscope, you think. Doctor. See a woman with a stethoscope, doctor. nurse. <laughs> right, y'all be yeah, y'all trying to be fancy. A doctor? No, we don't. Our biases are man, stethoscope, doctor, woman, nurse. That's where our mind works. Unfortunately, right, and we do that across so many domains of life, so many domains. Right, you see. Uh, we, we have these, these, these stereotypes, blonde woman, you're like, mm, maybe cute, but not so smart, not so good, right? So we have these negative stereotypes about people. You see uh, uh, somebody who, who uh, let me get into, I gotta be set, trying to be careful here. <laughs> I'm gonna stop right there with these, but y'all know what I mean anyway, right? <laughs> right? Church folks, we have stereotypes about church people. What's church stereotype about church people? Judgmental. Judgmental, see, I didn't even ask. She's like, boom, judgmental, got one for you. <laughs> Second one. You know they gossip. Come on now, right? But they can cook. Let's be honest, right? Like them church people, right? They judgmental and they gossip a little bit, man. But you know Mother Jenkins can throw down in the kitchen, right? And so we have these stereotypes and beliefs about people. Today we're going to talk about what to do with that. And we're going to look at the life of a woman named Deborah. And she is very unconventional. And we're going to see how do we deal with being unconventional leaders because we are called... All of us, if you're a Christ follower, you are called to lead in some domain, whether it's in your household, whether it's our young people, whether it's in school, whether it's at your workplace. But you are called to lead because why? You are supposed to demonstrate who God is. And by demonstrating who he is, you're supposed to attract people to him. Another example. So um, there, anybody heard of Perfecting Church in Detroit, Michigan? Anybody heard of the Winans family? Okay, right, so Perfecting Church is the Winans Church. Marvin Winans and uh, Vicky and Cece and BB and all 57 of the Winans, right? So they're known for having essentially concerts. You go to Perfecting, you're going to have some music, as you might imagine, right? 
Now, and we have in our mind, right, through our, our perspective on church and who can sing and all those sorts of things, we have in our mind what it was like. So can you imagine you're going to sing at Perfecting Church? You know you have to bring the noise. That means you have to sing well, okay? So let's, let me show you this little video. Um, these Korean young men at Perfecting Church. And observe the way in which the congregation kind of observes, pay attention, look at. And you can imagine the expectations, because this is the Winans Church. And if you know anything about gospel music, the Winans are that. And especially watch. young men kind of prove themselves, right? And you just saw it like, okay, people started nodding their head a little bit, then hand went up a little bit, then my girl jumped up, then you knew it was all over after that, right? And then Rev stood up, and so the whole thing. But what happened, they had to prove themselves because they did not fit the stereotype that people carry in their minds, even in the church. And so this morning, we want to talk about Deborah. And Deborah was an unconventional leader. So let's just jump into it, the kingdom concept this morning. Oh, let me pray first. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, as we go into your word, open up our minds, our hearts, Lord God, give us to be receptive to who you are. Transform us, Lord God, help us to recognize that our biases, our conscious and unconscious biases, our prejudices, Lord God, our stereotypes, 
those things that push other, some people out and bring others in. Lord God, that is not your design. That is not your intention. And so to open our eyes this morning as we look at an unconventional leader by the name of Deborah and help us to apply those insights and observations that we have for her life, Lord God, that we can be who you created us to be and be welcoming and accepting, Lord God, and be recipients of the blessings that you desire to have for us through your people, even if they don't look like what we think of as leaders or as your people. And so we thank you. We praise you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so the kingdom concept this morning is simply God uses whoever he chooses. You see, God uses whoever, whomever he chooses. What we think about them, our beliefs about them, our stereotypes, our perceptions. God is able and will use whoever he desires to use. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it's, uh, Samuel was visiting with Jesse, the, son, the father of David, and he was looking for the king. God said to him, in the house of Jesse, the king, the, 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 first, the, the next king, the person who's going to replace Saul, is one of David's, is one of Jesse's sons. And so he goes to the house of Jesse and he's like, hey, God has said that uh, one of your sons is going to be king. So introduce me to your sons. Let me see your son. And so the first son, of course, is the handsome one, the tallest one. He's the oldest. And then David says, listen, I mean, sorry, the Lord says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. You know, the research says that taller people, we assume that they're leaders. The research is that leaders are much more likely to be tall people than shorter people. Wow. It's crazy, right? Because people have biases, conscious and unconscious. Oh, this tall person is somebody I can follow. And so God says, listen, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. You say, we can think people are appealing, or we can think that this person is the person that God wants to use, but God says, don't pay attention to the demography, the height, the appearance, how cute, how wonderful, how whatever. He says, the Lord rejected him. And he says, the Lord, watch this, does not look at the things that people look at. He says, God uses a different set of lenses. His criteria is different than the one that we use. You see, we think, well, he's cute. He must be my husband. <laughs> well, maybe your husband ain't the cutest one. <laughs> but if he's the one that's going to love you, well, he's the one that's going to provide for you, going to take care of your household, going to show up, going to be the man that God is creating, he's going to pray for you, right. going to rub your feet. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Buy you some flowers. Do whatever it is you like to have done then that might be the one, and it might not be the tall, 6'6", 275, cute, however you like them, bow-legged, whatever your thing is. It might be somebody different, but it may be who want God, God wants to use. It says, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks beyond the superficial when he's looking for a leader, when he's looking for someone to serve him. He chooses. He's the one that makes the call. He will use the person that he chooses because he knows that person will do what they're called to do. So now we're in the book of Judges. We're in the book of Judges. Whoever's phone that is, please turn that off. We're in the book of Judges. And so you need to understand, Judges, there's an ongoing series. I think there's 12 Judges. And the story repeats over and over and over. So the backstory is the children of Israel Judges and what I call the sin cycle. And so what happens is the children of Israel sin. God disciplines them. They cry out, oh, God, please help us. Please forgive us. We're so sorry. We know that we've chased after other gods. We know that we've been pursuing everything but you. God disciplines them. He uses other nations to discipline them. They cry out to God. God raises up a judge. He identifies, calls a person sends that person forward as a leader to deliver them, and then there is peace as long as the judge lives, and then guess what? Push repeat. They do the same thing all over again. And so the whole book of Judges, literally, it says, and then again, and you, if you go to bcpgh.info, the notes are there under uh, sermon notes if you want to follow along with the, the scripture. And so let's walk through these stages real quick. Sin, Judges chapter 4, is where we're starting today. The book of Judges talking about uh, our girl, Deborah. Again, the Israelites, again, say again. again. Again, repeating the cycle again, again, and again. And again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now that Ehud, Ehud was the, the, the judge that was two people before um, 
uh, Deborah. And verse, the next one is discipline. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who had reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, so now let's follow the people. Sisera was the general of Jabin's army, the commander of his army. He was based in Harash Hagoyim because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. So after the judge had passed, the children again turned, children of Israel again turned back to their wicked ways, and then God used Sisera and Jabin to punish them, and so they were oppressed for 20 years. In verse 3, because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried out to the Lord for help. It says, after 20 years. It don't take that long for me. <laughs> Amen. Afternoon don't go well. Lord, help me, Jesus. Right. right? But after 20 years, they called out to God. And this was the pattern over and over again. And then the deliverance. We're going to jump to chapter 2 to show you the pattern. And we'll come back to chapter 4. It says, then the Lord raised up judges. So this is the pattern. God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, who saved them from the hands of these raiders or whoever was oppressing them. Verse 18, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. And then there's our sin cycle. Anybody got a sin cycle? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was a good laugh, right? You know, and that's why I said, you know, there's that, that thing, that, that, that thing that just keeps recurring in our lives, right? Maybe it's lying, cheating, stealing, watching pornography on purpose. You know, I ain't talking about it popped up on the side while you was watching the gospel video. It's about, you know, you, you, you know, you went from Instagram into the real deal, right? And so whatever your thing is, gossip, you know, it's, it's nice to talk about people, right? You bored, you ain't got nothing to do. Talk about people. Why not, right? And so there's that thing. All of us probably have that little something, and hopefully it's not the same as it was last year, and we're getting better and better, right? We don't just be like, I'm a sinner, I'm going to just lay here in it. But it's like, I'm getting better, but there are those things that God is still working on us, right? Maybe you have a little envy or anger or jealousy. But there's that stuff that God is working with us on. And then there's the discipline. I call it STDs, sinfully transmitted diseases. Right? That's guilt. That's anxiety. And not all anxiety or depression is caused by our sin. But there are things that we do. That, listen, if you have an anger problem and you always find yourself in conflict with people, that's a sinfully transmitted dis-ease. And you being in conflict will adversely impact your life. Amen? People won't want to be around you. Your kids, people will duck you at work. You call, they see your number, they're like, ah. I'm saying people will begin to avoid you. It'll impact your esteem, right? And so our behavior, unfortunately, has impact on our relationships with other people, our relationship with ourselves. And so that is the discipline because when, at least when, when these things, when God allows us to feel guilt, that's a good thing. I'm not talking about shame, right? Shame is I'm not worthy. I, I, I'm trying to hide. But guilt, when you've done something wrong, you should feel guilty. If you don't feel guilty and you've done something wrong, there's something wrong. Amen? Amen. You kill somebody and you just <laughs> blow off the thing and go about your business, that's a problem. You should be like, you know what? I shouldn't be doing this. Right? And then crying out. And that's when we say, God, if you, right, if you allow if I don't get caught this time, you know what I mean? If the test come back negative, I'm going to stop. You know what I'm saying? If the cop don't catch me this time, you know when you run the light, you done ran the light already, right, now you want to look around. You know what I'm saying? You looking in the rear of your mirror. You better go on drive at this point. Right? So crazy. God, if you, if I'll, I'll never do it again. Right? And so we cry out, and then God delivers us. He's merciful to us. He allows us to, you know, get a pass. And then peace comes, and everything is good, and then what happens? Boom, we repeat. 
And so we look at the children of Israel and we talk about how many times they're going to do this. When we're reading through this, they're like, oh, here we go again. But guess what? They're us. It's human nature. That's, the, that's why the Bible, I love it because it shows you how people are. And they're no different than we are. But there's hope for us. And so let's talk about Deborah. Deborah, her, her name means B. I have no idea what that has to do with maybe something she was got, her mama got stung when she was born. I have no idea. But her name means B. <clears throat> Judges chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Now, Deborah was a prophet. This is strange because Deborah was a woman, Deborah, prophet, one who spoke for God, who heard from God and spoke for God. This was not common at that time for women to be prophets. It also says she was a wife. She was a wife of Lipidus. And she was leading or judging Israel at that time. So she was an unconventional leader. She was an unconventional woman. The expectation was not that she would be leading. In that culture, in that time, women were not expected to be leaders and certainly not at a national level. But God, you see, he what? He chooses. He uses whom he chooses. We don't get to call the shots. Right? Just because they were thinking, well, what's she doing? It don't matter what they thought. God chose her and made her the leader of his people. And not only was she the leader or the judge, she was the prophet. She heard from God and communicated his will to people. And she was also a wife and possibly a mother. And she held court under the palm of Deborah. She had her own tree. The palm of Deborah, they called it. And she held court between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. The Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. And so she was a powerful, powerful woman. So first lesson for unconditional leaders from the story of Deborah, confidently do what God has called and gifted you to do. Listen, if you're a woman and you're in a non-traditional position, so what? If you're a man in a non-traditional position, so what? Remember Caleb. Caleb was 85 years old. He said to Joshua, give me my land, give me that hill that was promised to me. He was old. He says what? I'm as strong and able to fight as I was 40 years ago. Matter of fact, I got 45 years of pent-up anger. I really do want to fight somebody. <laughs> right? Or Timothy was a young pastor, and he was overwhelmed, distressed, and Paul said, listen, Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. You set an example for the believers in speech, what you say. In life, how you carry yourself. In love, purity. He says, you be the example for people. I know you're young, so what? Be the example. Old, young, man, woman, black, white, orange. If God has called you, lead with confidence. Why? Not in yourself, but in who God is. And so verse 6 says, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord... Notice, she doesn't say, this is what I say. But she says, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you. See what I'm saying? So she was, she was still a woman, but she was the leader, and she called this guy as the general. She says, listen, it's not about what I said to you. This is what God says. The Lord commands you. She's using the gift that she has as a prophet. You see, oftentimes people are shy, or when you get in a position of influence or power or whatever, whether it's, again, if it's a house, at school, at work, if God has called you and gifted you, you don't have to wonder. You don't have to second guess yourself. Remember we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we talked about stereotype threat, right? Well, because I'm a, I'm not supposed to do this. Or, or, or we talk about, right, imposter syndrome. Well, well, you know, I, I, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not, listen, if God has called you and gifted you, do not diminish who God is. Remember, we talked about having high God esteem. Forget your personal self-esteem, but having esteem for who God is. And if he gifted you and he called you, whatever it is he called you to do, lead with power. Lead with confidence. Be the example. Go into the place. I am here. The presence of the Lord is here. Why? Because I brought him with me. Amen. Amen. So when you go to work tomorrow, God has called you and gifted you. Lead. Go to school, lead. In the house, lead. Wherever you are, understand that God has called you to be a leader and to represent him. And you have the confidence that comes by being his child. Go with the 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. And then I will lead Sisera. Remember, Sisera is the general of Jabin. He says, I will lead them to you with his chariots his troops, and give them into your hands. 
So she's prophesying. She's saying, this is what God has said to you. Barak, do what God says, do. Second lesson, always give the glory to God and do not let people make you an idol. When you're an unconventional leader, oftentimes people will elevate you in ways that they would not if you were the traditional, right? So if you're a woman CEO, if you're, 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 you're an African-American in science, right? If you don't fit the story, if you're a man in social work or nursing, right? If you don't fit people's stereotypes, it's actually more easy to be successful in some ways because people's bar is so low. Anybody ever underestimate you? Amen. Have you ever been underestimated? People are like, well, you know, you did, whatever. You didn't go to the right school. Oh, you from Homewood or you, 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 you're a woman or you're, you're black, you're white. You, you know what I mean? So we have all these stereotypes, these unconscious biases about people. We see people, learn a little bit about their demography, and we put them in a box. So if you excel, and you will, why? Because you're citizens of the kingdom. You represent the king. You're gifted. You're anointed. You're skilled. You're talented. You're brilliant. You will excel. But don't let people make you an idol. Bring, always give the glory to God. Verse 8. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. He's like, I believe you're a prophet. You're amazing. I heard what you said. I'm going to do it. I believe it. I'm going. However, if you don't go with me, I won't go. What? <laughs> You're the general, bruh. God said to you, go. He's going to give Sisera into your hands. Go. Defeat the people. Defeat the enemy. Free the people. And he says, listen, Deborah, if you'll go, I'll go. But if you, listen, don't make anybody an idol. God was very clear. But an idol is simply anything or anyone that you put before God. He is in essence saying, forget what God said. Now, it, listen, nothing wrong with him wanting her to go. She clearly heard from the Lord. Right? Listen, follow the leaders that God is leading. That's good. But you don't decide, well, if you don't go, I ain't going. I don't care what God said. And so do not allow people to make you an idol. Always give glory to God. And so watch her response. Certainly I'll go with you. And notice now, Deborah's not saying, I'm going to strap up and we're ready to go fight. She's like, listen, I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to delegate. You're the general. I'm not. But I'll go with you, no problem. But watch this. But because of the course you're taking, because of the path that you're on, because of your mindset, is what she's saying, the honor will not be yours. You see, as a general, your credibility was built as you conquered folk. You remember when, um, who was it? Uh, Joab. He was overtaking a city, and he calls David and said, hey, man, you better come because I'm about to take this city, and I will get the honor. I'll get the glory. Y'all remember this? Y'all reading along with us, right? And so Je David's like, let me get up from here and go on and take this, handle this, because I'm the king. And so same kind of thing, but... <clears throat> Deborah's like, listen, bro, the honor that's supposed to accrue to you as the general of the people is going to be given into, to a woman because you have decided that you want to ignore what God is saying through me and try to make me an idol. So she puts dude way back in the spot like, nah, man, it's about God. It's about what the Lord has said. And so Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. Verse 10. Then Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. So he called the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali and said, fellas, it's time to go to war. The 10,000 men went up with his command. Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zanim near Kadesh. Now it's interesting. Now remember what um, Deborah said. Going to give Sisera into the hands of a woman. So I'm thinking... When I was reading this the first time, the Deborah's going to, like, shoot dude, right? She's going to pull out the, she's going to be in the chariot, pull out the arrow, whatever, shoot him. But that's not it. So let's pay attention and watch what happens. Verse 12, when they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned the Harish, from Harash Hoigim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Okay? So Sisera's like, okay, y'all, Israel is ready to fight. Let's go. So he calls his 900 men 
with their chariots of iron, which is a big deal, right? So dude got tanks. He got the equipment. He's ready to go. And so remember, they had oppressed Israel for 20 years. Israel finally raises up. Barak has been commissioned through Deborah, through her prophecy. And so they're ready for the fight. And then verse 14, then Deborah said to Barak, go. This is the day that the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. He is not, has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So my man is still procrastinating a little bit, right? He's still a little bit scared. At least she's there with him. You know, she called him out a little bit. She's like, bro, you a punk. I told you to go. <laughs> you a little, you know, a little weak. And so she's like, today is the day, sir. Let's get it. Let's go. This is the day. The Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. Verse 15, at Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and the army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. And so what happened was they had these 900 uh, chariots. If you look fast forward to chapter 5, it suggests it was a great storm. And it says the river overflowed. And so guess what? You're doing a great job. You're riding your chariots. You're doing your thing. And some of these chariots, they even had knives on the axles. And so as you're riding through, you're cutting folks. You're um, hitting the horses, lame, making the horses lame. So you're doing damage, right? So these guys, they're ready. But guess what? Big storm comes. You got water and mud. How does that work with your, with your uh, <laughs> right? So unless you got four-wheel drive on your chariot, you got a problem. And so now these guys are all confident, but now they're stuck in the mud, so they jump out and start running. And so the Lord routed Sisera in his chariots by the army, an army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and began to fly, fly, uh, fled on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as that place. And, uh, <laughs> and all Sisera's uh, troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. So all 900 of these guys in their chariots, who were used to, you know, when you got your wheels and you're doing your thing and you're in your tank, you know how to handle business, but all of a sudden, you don't have a plan B, and you're running. And it says all of those men were killed. So finally, number three, be willing to take bold, unconventional action for God. Be willing to take bold, unconventional action. But if you're an unconventional leader, you have to be willing to take unconventional action. Do crazy stuff, things that people are kind of surprised by, wouldn't expect from you. And this is where we introduce uh, this next woman, verse 17, Sisera, meanwhile, fled to the foot, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. So Sisera's boss, Jabin, has a relationship with this guy named uh, Heber. And so he sees Heber's tent or his wife's tent. And he's like, oh, cool. This is friend. And so he's figuring, I can escape, I can hide in the tent of my friend's wife, and nobody will expect me because you certainly did not have a man in your tent back then. It wasn't your, it was either your, your husband, your father, maybe your brother. But you certainly didn't have men to whom you were not related up in your tent. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's a good policy today, you know what I'm saying? Amen. Don't have no men up in your tent. Turn to somebody and say, don't have no men up in your tent, sis. All right, don't have no men up in your tent. I like that. That's a separate message or another day. <laughs> Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come, my Lord, come right in. He should have been suspicious. <laughs> he should be like, hold up. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. This is the part where the music would be playing in the background. It would be getting real tense. He says, I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. And it says, she opened a skin of milk. And gave him a drink and covered him up. Now, as you know, or maybe you don't know, you know milk has sedative principles. Amen. You know, not like a little warm glass of milk, for those of you who are not lactose intolerant. Uh, <laughs> a little warm milk sets you straight. And so dude's like, can I have some water? She's like, I'll go you one better, bro. <laughs> See, people don't give you what, they ask, what you ask them for. Be careful. <laughs> Stand in the doorway. He's trying to give orders, right? Like, dude, you just ran away. Stand in the door of the tent, he told her. If someone comes and asks, is anyone there? Say, nope, uh-uh, nobody in here. Sisera is not in my tent, sleep, not at all. He is not here. Verse 21, but Yael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg 
and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground. Sorry, children. <laughs> Thought y'all was going to be a children's church. And, when, and the Bible says some funny stuff sometimes. And it says, and then he died. No kidding. <laughs> you pinned to the ground with a, a, tent, a tent peg through your head, right? Now, again, she, she, the, in that culture, the women set up the stuff. So she knew how to handle a hammer and a tent peg. This was not anything. But she wasn't the general. She wasn't, she was not, uh, who's our guy? Quick quiz. Who's the general? Sisera, who's the, who's the Israelite Jew? Barak, very good. So this woman is not a military operator. She's not a traditional warrior. But she takes unconventional activity. She is willing because she heard what the Lord had said. Even though her husband was a friend, right? Heber was a friend of Sisera and them. She was about the business of the Lord. And so he comes in, falls asleep, and she hammers a tent peg through this dude's head. Whew. Listen, be careful. Underestimate a woman if you want to. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Oh, I'm safe. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Don't mess with a woman. Verse 22. Just then, after the little stake incident, Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, and Yael went out to meet him. Come. She said, I got something to show you. I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple. Again, not surprised, dead. <laughs> On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. In chapter 5, next chapter, last verse, then the land had peace for 40 years. And so Deborah was an unconventional leader. Didn't fit the stereotype, broke the mold. But you see, if God has called you and gifted you, it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter if that's not a role that generally people like you fill. Because God, listen, God uses who he chooses. Amen. And we can't define that. You see, we would rather lose than follow the person that God has chosen. You see, so we can't put these parameters and our rules and our perspectives on who's supposed to do what and who looks like a leader. You see, if you're not handling your business, God is not like, oh, well, I'm stuck. I guess I won't be able to do what I want to do. God is not hindered by you. He is not hindered by me. God can use a baby. You remember the pastor say, if y'all won't praise me, I'll put some miles on some rocks. be the rockets. <laughs> I thought that was funny. It just struck me. I'm sorry. But anyway, <laughs> listen, I'll have these rocks singing. The rocks will cry out if you won't praise me. And so God will use whoever he chooses. The question is, do you want to be the one? Do you want to be who God chooses to use to accomplish his purpose, to advance his kingdom, to make earth more like heaven? Praise God. Amen. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to die for the express purpose that we could have what's called abundant life. It says he came to destroy the work of the devil. He came that we could have eternal life. And so today, if you've never made Christ your king and you find yourself stuck in the sin cycle, Jesus came to forgive us. And then he actually gave us his spirit to help us get out of the sin cycle. And so today, if you don't know Christ, if you've never made him your boss, the CEO, the king of your life, I invite you. Pray with me. In the first step, now again, prayer and saying, you know, God coming to my heart, we say that. That's not magic, but it's a statement of an aspiration of your heart. And if you will surrender your life to him and allow him to be your king, 
you begin a journey, a lifelong journey of becoming like his son. So join me today in prayer. And if you know that God has called you to do something, and even if you're an unconventional leader, and you've been resisting it because you say, I'm a, it doesn't matter. If God called you and he gifted you, be confident in it. Go, do it. Trust him. He's there for you. He got your back. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, for if there's someone who's in the house with us, someone online who today, they recognize that they need you. They need you to fulfill their purpose. They need you to accomplish the assignment for their life. Well, Lord God, those of us who have already surrendered our life to you, but we may be not living up to potential that you placed in us. God, we come back and we ask for your forgiveness. Forgive us, Lord. Wash us. Cleanse us. We surrender our lives to you all over again. And we ask you to take over. Be our king and we will follow you. We will allow you to use us as you choose. So we ask you this now. In the name of Jesus receive your forgiveness, receive your salvation for your children. We now become ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And we ask that you would guide us and lead us and send us on mission to advance your kingdom. And Father, as we prepare for the communion, God, we remember on the the day that you were betrayed, you assembled your disciples and you said, I want to give you something to remember me by. preparing to die. I'm going to be beaten and abused and my blood is going to be shed. But I'm doing it because I love you. You said, as often as you do this, remember me. And so, Father, we, as we prepare for communion, oh God, we pray for the cup that represents your blood that you allowed to be shed for us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But you loved us. And you shed your life. You gave your blood for us. And then, Lord God, the bread that represents your body that was pinned to a cross, that was beaten, that was abused. And you did that all for us. And so, Father, if there's anything that hinders us from being positioned properly to receive the communion right now, Lord God, forgive us cleanse us. Oh God, we acknowledge our sin, but we thank you that you're our Savior. And so we experience the forgiveness that comes with just asking and turning and pursuing your path. So God, we just pray again, you bless the elements and let them, oh God, be a spiritual nourishment to our bodies, our minds, our emotions. We pray this in the name of Jesus. If you don't have your elements, raise your hand. I'm sure someone will give that to you. Raise your hands again. Just make sure that they see you.
Bible says Jesus took the bread, he broke it and said, this is my body was given for you. Like manner, he took the cup and said, this cup represents a covenant, a new covenant. Amen. God bless you. Turn to the person on your left and your right. Tell them my pastor loves you. God bless you. Hope to see you at the picnic. I don't know if I'm playing games because, you know, I win and then folks be mad at me and stuff. But uh, I'll be there. I look forward to seeing you at the picnic. God bless you. See you in a little bit.